We'll be starting up here in about a minute. Good morning and uh, welcome to another one of our Topical Tuesday webinars. I'm David Orr. I'm the director here at the New York LTAP Center, uh, the Cornell Local Roads Program. And I want to welcome you to an intersection signs and marking session that we're doing today. And hopefully you'll get something out of this. Our goal today is pretty simple. We're going to be talking primarily about signs and markings, but we're going to spend a little bit of time on geometry and also on uh, uh, some miscellaneous things that we've picked up that you may find interesting and useful. Uh, for instance, we may talk a little bit about things like what you see in the background here of our slide, which is a mini roundabout here in the city of Ithaca. But primarily we're gonna be talking about the signs and the markings and some things on geometry. Uh, for everybody, if you're interested, the materials that we're talking about today all come from our uh, two handouts or two uh, items that we're pasting into the chat. Uh, one of them is our traffic sign handbook, and the other one is our workshop manual solutions for safer roads and streets. And you can get those by going to the chat and opening them up. And for those who haven't been on one of our webinars before, just as a reminder, uh, the chat is disabled for you to put information in, but we'll send you things like the links to these uh, materials for today in the chat. You can use the Q&A though, however, so please do that. Uh, put your questions in there. I'll try to answer them as we go along. And I think we'll have a couple of minutes at the very end to answer any specific questions that you have after we get done with the case studies. You can also raise your hand. We will do that uh, now and then just to answer a few questions of people and to get your feedback. Okay, uh, this is worth uh, professional development hours for engineers who need them. Uh, you'll need to stand for 90% um, and let us know that you need the PDH after you get your basic certificate. That should take a few days to get out to you. Now, for those who haven't seen them before, I do recommend downloading these materials. The first one is Solutions for Safer Roads and Streets. Uh, that particular one, oh, the second link isn't working according to Q&A. Uh, Adam and Amanda. So magically, they will put an updated link into the uh, uh, chat. So thanks for letting us know, Mina. Uh, Solutions for Safer Roads and Streets has a lot more information than just intersections. It has stuff on signs and road widening and a whole bunch of ideas to help make all of our roads safer. And that may be something you want to download. You can also get a hard copy of any of these by just asking us. The Traffic Sign Handbook has been around actually since 1985 when it was really originally developed by the New York State Department of Transportation. And we've taken it over in just around the turn of the century and we've been keeping it updated. And there is a new version of the MUTCD coming out relatively soon. Once it comes out, we'll be updating the traffic sign handbook again. It covers about 80 to 90% of the signs out there, pretty much almost all of the signs that you need except for parking. Um, there's enough uniqueness with parking, we haven't included it. So we're going to be talking about intersections today. Um, and so that's something that is hopefully that's something we don't have major problems with. I, I hope you don't have problems with it. Uh, we don't want to see something like this. Watch the two ends carefully. If you saw the car go through, five seconds later could have been a really bad day. Um, you can't stop everything, but hopefully if we've done our job right, intersections are safer and they're doing their job. They're conflict points. Uh, they're one of the three things that the Federal Highway Administration concerns itself with the most. Intersections, pedestrians and bicycles and run off the road. And we've done sessions on running off the road before. So today we're gonna to talk about intersections. More commonly, we're talking about stop and yield controlled intersections, but intersections of all types, how do we make them safer 
to, so they do the job of moving people, but at the same time, uh, they don't create hazards themselves. Now, before we get into intersections, one thing I want to talk about, and this is something that is pretty important, uh, is called reaction time and then leading into stopping distance. So reaction time has to do with how quickly do you respond to something? If you don't know something is coming, it takes time for you to react. How much time do you think it takes? In the Q&A, somebody put in there, how, many, how much time do you think it takes? If you don't know something is going to happen for you to actually react. And yeah, somebody put two seconds in there. Okay, two seconds is a pretty good number. That's a pretty good guess. Yeah. Two and a half seconds is what we use. And Craig, yeah, you got that right. Two and a half seconds to actually uh, make the decision is what we use when we do design. Everybody actually reacts slightly differently, of course. Some people react faster, you know, and some people slower. And if you're ready for something, you're even faster. But we typically use two and a half seconds to react to something. And that's pretty important. Because then, and only then, after you've reacted and put your foot down on the brake, do you actually stop your vehicle. So when we're talking about things like stopping sight distance, as an example, it's not just the distance to put the brake on the car, but it's the perception reaction distance for you to actually put your foot down. And that's that two and a half seconds that we're dealing with. And then the stopping distance depends also on the weather, icy conditions, other factors, but it's that perception that we care about. Now, something that's been added recently into the national standards, the Astro Green Book, that you may want to keep in mind is something called the decision site distance. And this is especially important at intersections, and especially in places that are urban, suburban, or even just a little built up. At two and a half seconds, it turns out, you might need even more because there's all these other distractions around us that cause us to not necessarily be looking at the vehicle stopping in front of us or the rock that suddenly comes out into the roadway or the little kid who's running to catch his ball. So we need to be careful and take care of this, and especially at intersections. But one that I also don't want to forget about, and one we don't think about enough, and this is part of a PSA from the people who did the TV show Glee, this is a cell phone. And if you don't put that cell phone down and you're texting, your reaction time, you add five seconds to your reaction time. Think about that. Five seconds. If you're traveling at 30 miles an hour, that's 45 feet per second. Technically 44 because it's not quite one and a half. But you're adding five seconds to your reaction time. So we need to get rid of any distractions. Concentrate on the driving task as much as possible. And intersections are a serious place to worry about. Now, we are going to talk about, as I said, signs and markings primarily. But before we get into that, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the geometry of intersections. And there is all kinds of fun geometry in intersections. Uh, it could be something as simple as, let me see what color I've got right now, because I don't think I like the color. Yeah, it automatically defaulted to white. White's not going to work too well in this case. We'll go there. So, uh, you know, you could have an intersection. The one we all think about when we think about intersections is the four-way intersection, and whether it has control or not, traffic lights, things like that. That's the most common. But truth be told, we all know you could have a T intersection like you've got here in number one. That's fairly common. We can talk a little bit about skew, and we're going to do that a bit because skew intersections are an issue. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the why. These are much more common than probably we'd like to see, and they have some severe issues because you've increased your conflict points. Because now instead of just having the one at the intersection itself, you've created two additional intersections. You can get a highly skewed intersection, which old roads, that's what we did. How do we overcome those problems? That's the hard one. We're not going to be able to do that completely today. But when you get odd intersections like that, think about how to reduce the chances of a crash by looking at that reaction time, that sight distance. How can we make things smoother and easier for people to drive through them? And of course, you get some odd intersections like the Y up there in the right or a five-way. We actually have a an intersection that's interesting here in Ithaca. I drive through it uh, when I go up to play hockey or go into the grocery store or something like that. I'll sometimes go through it. It's actually a six-way intersection called a five-way intersection. 
uh, it can get very complicated. And then, of course, the roundabout, which actually is a pretty cool technique, and we'll spend some time on that as well. But when it comes to the geometry of roadways, I just want you to keep in mind that we have lots of these. Most of our intersections have already been built up. But every time you add a conflict point, you have to be careful. And because we know the high-speed crossovers are some of the most dangerous crashes that we've got. And here's one here on the Cornell campus. It's a three-way big Y intersection. And it's going to be hard to fix, but how can we reduce the conflict points? Now, one thing we don't always think about as an intersection, but is an intersection, in fact, it's our most common intersection, is driveways. So everything I'm talking about when it comes to intersections is true for driveways as well. So every driveway you've got is just a mini intersection. So you need to have the same issues of sight distance and other factors that we're going to be talking about. Now, before we get going, just because I see there's quite a few of you on here, I'm actually going to go back one and watch this by magic. I'm going to hold the hands up. I want to see who's here today because I see there's about 25 of us on. So, uh, Adam, you want to pop the polls in there? So the first one is, uh, what's your primary job function? Are you uh, just in the field? Are you the highway superintendent, an engineer? Um, and then, of course, we'll have the infamous other category just to give me a sense of who's on today. Okay, so about half of you are engineers, uh, and then a split between the uh, other and the highway worker. Okay. Okay, next poll. I think that's, let me see. What's poll number two? Who do you work for? Okay, village, town, city, state, or the private sector. Okay. Okay, so that particular one, about two thirds of you voted. Oh, actually, most of you have voted. So we'll stop that one and share the results. A, a mixture, villages, towns, county, city, state, private sector. Cool. Uh, all of us have intersections, so all of us have to deal with these kind of things. And then finally, our last poll is how long? What's your experience level? And then this will help me as I go through and how much time I'm going to spend on things. Okay, so we got a fairly experienced group, though we got a couple of new folks. Okay, cool. That's good to know. And here's the results. Most of you are over 20. So I know that means you've got a lot of experience. Hopefully what I'm going to show you today gives you a new idea, maybe something to think about. That's my goal as much as anything else. Okay. So let's talk about First geometry, some things you might want to think about when you're looking at intersections. And I know these are not always cheap fixes, but as you're making upgrades, think about these kind of things if you possibly can. So we're going to start with skewed intersections. Now, this is an extreme skew, but they're not that uncommon. Skews are very, very difficult. Okay, When you're in your vehicle, it's really relatively easy to turn your head 90 degrees. So wherever you are right now, just to take your head and turn it like you would if you were sitting and driving, and see what you can see, OK? So pick out something that you can see. Now, and better yet, put your hand where you can see. And my hand's disembodied because of the electronic background. But I'm going to put my hand where I can see it. Now, actually, leave the hand still, turn your whole body, and focus on that hand. Look how much you've missed. Everything behind your hand, you don't see. So if there's something behind you, for instance, a highly skewed intersection, you can't see necessarily. So you have to turn your whole body, which is very difficult to do when you're in a car or worse yet, a truck that's got nothing even in the back. So a skewed intersection can be very risky, which is why we actually try to shoot for as close as we possibly can to a 90 degree, okay? The closer to 90, the better, because you can see in both directions. We can go up, you know, 10 or 15 degrees off of that, a slight skew. But even a slight skew can cause an issue, OK? So closest to 90 as you possibly can. But of course, that's not necessarily going to be cheap. So if I have a highly skewed intersection like this, what are my options? Anybody have an idea of what I might do in a situation like this? 
if I want to get close to that 90 degrees, what could I do here? You can throw that in the Q&A for me. What could I do here? You could curve the road coming into the main. So what you would do in that case is you'd come in here and you'd figure out where the center line is and then match it back in. Yep, a small curve, realign the roadway. That'd be great, that's optimum. We know that that's not necessarily cheap, but that's a possibility. And you'll actually find when you start looking at your intersections, figure out what the actual traffic is. Sometimes it turns out, history has put the stop sign here, but the real traffic is actually on this diagonal road. And you may actually have a situation where the, this is the minor road over here. Actually, I'll put it up here, the text. This is actually the minor road. In that particular case, you might actually want to come in here and curve this road in and then make this the main through road. Before you spend any money, really figure out what you want that alignment to be. And yes, you may put a turning lane in if depending on the traffic, you would actually could put a turning lane for the people coming here to get onto this roadway, depending on the traffic volume. Look at the intersections carefully. Take your time. It's well worth the time and effort it takes. But one thing I want to tell you, if you are redoing any intersections, think about the vehicles using the intersection, okay? Cars, trucks, and of course, semi-tractors, things like that. And a good rule of thumb for that skew is you want to have enough distance for the larger vehicle to actually sit at a 90 degree perpendicular, okay? This is one here in the city of Ithaca that was done about 20, 25 years ago. And it's not long enough of a straightaway for a vehicle to be able to actually sit 90 degrees and see in both directions. This is a hard one. It's actually a four-way intersection you can see off to the left. That's a tricky one. But if you can, really what you want to think about is a longer, turn distance. Now this is one that was under construction, had just been done, wasn't quite finished yet. You can see the old skew here and it was being taken out at the top of the picture. And they did a nice job of turning it with a long enough distance so that the larger vehicle, the truck or semi-truck, depending on what you've got, can actually sit at the 90 degree. It's actually quite safe to do that. But of course you have to have sight distance in both directions wherever you bring in your new intersection. Okay. Now, the other thing you want to think about is those Y intersections. Okay. Now, I know I've got a photograph of some good Ys that have been fixed. I spent way too much time looking for them. And I couldn't find them. So I went on Google Maps and found at least a Y intersection uh, out there, an example of what I'm talking about. You've probably seen these. You've probably even got some. Older roads, we tended to put a Y in here in both directions. In this case, I need to get my yellow pen. There we go. So essentially what happens is you get a situation where you've got a big Y like this. When you had slow moving vehicles, horse and buggies, things like that, it actually made some sense. You could come off and go back on and it wasn't the issue of high speed. So there wasn't people having to stop. But now if you try to do that same thing, the problem you run into is you create essentially two highly skewed intersections and an intersection right here in the, the top of the Y that nobody really knows who has right of way and you can sign it till the cows come home. Try to remove these as you can. The great thing is if you've got these, it's in your right of way, so you can come in here fairly easily and make yourself a nice square, okay? Again, following the same rule that when you're done, you've got enough room for your larger vehicle, your truck, to sit in the perpendicular section, okay? Now, of course, when you're done, you need to be worried about the corner radius. If it's too sharp, your trucks can't get around the corner and they swing into the other lane, that could be a problem for you. So. 
Again, think about that. But if you're in an urban area or you have any pedestrians, you don't want that corner radius to be so large that now the pedestrians have a hard time trying to cross. So that's a balancing act. You might be able to go in there and put mountable curbs, but again, think about who's using the roadway, who's using the intersection, okay? You can put in turn lanes. Now this is an interesting one. This happens to be down in Big Flats, not too far from the uh, Elmira Airport, where they put in not just a turning lane like you might see where you just widen it here at the stop sign, but they've actually put a whole separate turning uh, area and then they come in with a merge section, just like you would off the interstate and bringing two lanes together. It's a pretty cool little intersection actually. Um, Again, when you're looking at your intersections, think about the traffic, where is it going, and try to deal with all of those various situations that you have to deal with. What it really comes down to in a lot of cases is the sight distance, the sight lines, okay? Can you see the intersection? Does it show up? Can, once you're at the intersection, can you see the traffic in both directions or all directions if it's a multi-leg uh, intersection? Every intersection is going to have its own unique geometry, but the sight distance is probably the single most important thing to think about. Okay. And of course, uh, does anybody see a problem here? What do you see in the Q&A? What do you see? Yeah, visibility is very poor. Yeah, it feels more like a driveway. Um, I like the old truck, by the way. <laughs> if you look carefully in the background, you see a nice old truck there. But yeah, there's a pine tree blocking the sight distance. So what are your solutions here? Assuming you can. First, we'll worry about the. You could cut the tree down, possibly. Yeah. And you may need to from a safety standpoint. Okay, I know politically that can be very, very difficult, especially in a small urban area. And depending on traffic volume and speed, that could be difficult. So one thing you may have to do as a minimum is replace that stop sign, a yield sign with a stop sign. If you don't have the sight distance and you can't get the tree cut for a variety of reasons, even if it's political, you need to think about public safety. And I know people don't necessarily want that stop sign but you may have to put it out. But even then, there's a minimum sight distance you'd need to have. And so let's talk about what that minimum sight distance is, okay? Now in the solutions for safer roads and streets, you'll see a series of drawings that talk about these sight distances. And this particular one happens to be for the sight distance for uh, at a square crossing, okay? It changes by the way with skew, but that gets more complicated. Assuming you're about 10 feet back from the edge of the roadway, which is where most people tend to stop, whether they have markings or not. And then you can see to the right, the right line of sight. You can see to the left, the line of sight. And you have three choices. You can either make a left turn, cross, or a right turn. And in terms of the biggest sight distance you need, it turns out that is either the crossing the major road or the left turn, because you've got longer time that you need. And actually, depending on the vehicle, it could be a truck turning, can be one of the longest sight distances that you need. So if we look at measured in feet, depending on the speed of the traffic on the major road, you can see the distance that you need to be able to see, that sight line distance, okay? Okay, that's that line of sight. And the sight distance, even though we can see it a diagonal, we measure it parallel to the major road. So how far down that major road do you need to see the vehicles, okay? And that's in feet, okay? But let's look at it in a different way. Let's take that sight distance in feet. Now, earlier I said, if you're traveling 30 miles an hour, you're actually moving about 45 feet per second, uh, 44 if you wanna get more precise. The actual answer is if you take the speed in miles per hour, okay, oh, let's get a different color here. Let's try this color. So you take the speed in miles per hour times 1.47, that gives you the speed in feet per second. Now, I don't know about you, you can do it 1.47. I just do one and a half, it's close enough. 
Okay. But if you can think about that, this, you can take the speed at 30 miles an hour or 40, and you multiply that out, 30 becomes about 45, 40 miles an hour is about 60, and so on. You can actually then say, well, how many seconds of sight distance do I need? Okay. So let's take those same numbers, and rather than measuring them in feet, let's measure them in seconds. Okay. So if you're a car sitting at the intersection, this time you need to see for those left turn and crossing maneuvers is about 7.4 to 7.7 .7 seconds uh, for the typical speeds we see. In other words, if you think about it, you need about eight seconds of time. For a single unit truck, like a dump truck, you need about 10 seconds, rounding up and being conservative. For a tractor trailer, you need about a dozen seconds, okay? So here's a way to actually check out your intersection. Stand at the intersection about where the vehicle would be. Get yourself at the height you'd need to be for a person in a car that's about 42 inches, so you have to crouch down a little bit. If you're in a truck, you may need to be in a truck to get to the right height because you're actually up a little bit, as you know. But if you think about it, wherever you are, for the car, if you're standing there, watch vehicles go by, and if you don't have eight seconds of time, you've got a problem, okay? For a single unit truck, a dump truck, you probably need about 10 seconds of time. And for a semi-tractor trailer, if there's a large sem number of semi-tractors using that particular intersection, you need about 12 seconds. And it's a good way to quickly check to see the safety of a particular intersection. It's a little bit less for that right turn maneuver, but truth be told, it's so close that just check both directions, eight, 10, and 12 seconds, looking at the primary vehicle you're concerned about. And if you don't have that, then you need to start thinking about, how do I improve the geometry? How do I improve safety? What do I need to do to make things better? Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about the signs. Okay. And signs for intersections exist of all types. Everything from the intersection signs as you approach it to the signs at the intersection itself. Okay. Now, signs communicate. They are our primary form of communications and markings, which we'll talk about as well. Signs communicate our regulations. They communicate our warning information, things like that. Good signs do, but poor signs and markings communicate things like we don't know where we're headed. Okay. So signs are a communication tool. They can also be an extremely valuable tool if the road itself isn't communicating because roads communicate also. So what I've got here is a video I took, and I see somebody on here who ought to know where this intersection is. And let me get my pen back, my arrow back, so I can start the video. Okay, you can see the stop ahead sign. Okay. That stop ahead sign is pretty important. Imagine if it wasn't there. We're cresting over a hill. Whoops, I went too far. There we go. What does your brain see? Your brain actually sees the hill in the other direction. You don't see that intersection, okay? That's a tough one, okay? Um, and the person who uh, put in something there, and I both know this intersection very, very well, it's a tough one. That one's a really hard one to fix, but let me finish the video, and then I wanna get your thoughts and ideas. What could be done to improve this both with signs and are with geometry. And of course, Mr. Microsoft wants to keep doing things to me. Okay, I'll stop it here when we can actually see the stop sign clearly. So even though there's a stop sign and stop doing that to me, Dave. Any thoughts and ideas of what could be done in this particular case? Because it's a tough one. Put a stop ahead on both sides of the road. So go, go back up the road here with a stop ahead and put one on both sides. Yeah, second stop ahead, that's a possibility, yeah. Possibly taller signpost, okay. The one thing I do like here, I really liked when they did it, 
was they put in the, what are called conspicuity marks, which is those extra uh, signs on there that warn you there's something different. You could try a larger sign panel. It's difficult. Signs help, but they don't solve all of our problems, no matter what. Okay. And as you come down over here, it's a pretty steep drop. Um, it'd be hard to change the geometry here. Okay. So it's something to think about. It's not an easy solution here. But when you drive an intersection, when you're looking at it, you can improve your pavement markings, you can do all kinds of things. Think about how humans react. Human factors is part of the equation that we have to think about. So what I want to do is I want to talk about what we can do with traffic control. Okay. Now, you could have no control. Okay. You could have no control at all at an intersection. And you probably have some of these. If you're with a county or city, you may not, but you'd be surprised. <laughs> you have some, you just don't realize it. But even some of your intersections with other town and village uh, roadways may have no control. Okay. You may put up a yield sign. Okay. It's actually, if you can, a yield sign can actually be the right thing to do in many cases. Okay. A stop sign, that's probably our most common traffic control. Eventually, we think about putting in a traffic signal. And then finally, I put in roundabout. Now, some people would say, wait, that's a geometry issue. You showed a roundabout before. I did. That's why there's a, it's an overlap. Changing to a roundabout is a form of changing the entire traffic control. And we'll talk about that just a little bit. So no control. Uh, does anybody have a no control intersection? in their municipality. You can either put it in the Q&A or if you know you've got one. You don't have to tell me where it is. I just want you to, yeah, you do. And by the way, everybody does. <laughs> you may have one officially. Um, and if it's between two municipal roadways, your own system or an intersecting with another agency, they work really well for low volume, really low, like under, you know, under 400 vehicle day per day kind of thing really good sight distances, okay? They can work well. And by the way, think about your driveways. Most driveways are essentially no control. Technically, you're supposed to stop or you control yourself. How many people actually stop at the end of their own driveway? But that's a no control situation. So when you cite your driveways, think about the fact that you're not putting up a stop sign. You want good sight distance, okay? Next thing we go to, and this is usually the minimum you see on the municipal system to a municipal system, town to town, town to county, things like that, it's a yield sign. Very effective when there's plenty of sight distance and there's low delay. There's not a lot of traffic. Because remember, the signs are not there to stop the vehicle. They're to assign right of way. Okay. Who's got priority? So you could go to a stop control situation. Okay but you're not using that to slow traffic down. You're really using that to assign who's got the priority, who's got the right of way. And you can get some interesting situations like this is one here right at the edge of the Cornell campus where the vehicles that coming onto the state highway have to stop, but the road actually goes straight. And so they've actually put up a sign under the stop sign that says oncoming traffic does not stop to warn people, hey, they don't stop coming at you. And I walk through this intersection going to work every day, and it is an interesting thing to watch. And you can tell when people aren't used to the intersection. So things to think in mind. Just please don't use stop signs as traffic control in terms of slowing traffic down. Uh, you know, you see things like this, double stop signs. Putting up an unwanted, unnecessary stop sign can actually make things worse. This is a thing that was done out in uh, Michigan where they put up a stop sign at the intersection of uh, Main Street and Price in the particular community, excuse me, Oglethorpe Avenue in this particular community. And before they put them up, people were going about 30 miles an hour through the intersection. And by the way, the speed limit is 25. <laughs> um, when they put the stop signs up, they didn't actually drop it to zero. You'll notice nobody's actually, the average speed is not zero. The average speed is actually closer to five to 10 miles an hour. So people were doing that rolling, never quite stop through the inter intersection. And what's the most dangerous time when people are slowing and stopping and moving and going? 
it's that period of time when they're accelerating. From here, my pen decides to work. From, yeah, we'll do this color here. From here to here. It's that box around the intersection is actually one of the most dangerous times when you're decelerating and then re-accelerating. So you've actually not really changed much of that. And what people did is they started going faster in the areas a little further away to make up the time. Artificially slowing people down can actually make things less safe. And this is just speed. The crash rates went up, as you might expect. So be careful. Stop signs are a great tool, but they're designed to just assign who's got the priority in an intersection. And good signs help. Poor signs like these can actually do more harm than good. So keep that in mind. Now, one question we do get asked, um, and you may not have this happen often, but it's something to think about is, where am I gonna put up a stop sign or a yield sign? In your traffic sign handbook, you can, as I say, download it, or we can send you a copy. We have plenty of them. We've actually got a table in there that will help you figure that out. And there's a graph to help you figure out as well. And the concept behind this is, if you've got enough sight distance where you can actually see the vehicles on the side road, on the major road, excuse me, uh, and stop in time, then you can get ahead and put up a yield sign. But the key is, do you have enough sight distance? Now, again, this is assuming a relatively low volume, okay? Not a lot of conflicts. Well, the way you do that is pretty simple. You just have to measure the distance to the object. It could be a tree, it could be a building, something that blocks your sight distance. And the thing is, if you measure parallel to the major road and parallel to the minor road, the fact that there's a skew drops out of the equation. You don't even have to worry about it. So it's actually pretty cool that way. So if we have an actual intersection that we're worried about, okay, and we measure B at say, uh, 45 feet, again, parallel to the minor road. So on the skew, you actually measure it. And the speed limit on the road is 55 miles an hour. Well, then you can use this table, go down the table and tell the intersect. So if B is on the left column at 45, 55 miles an hour and the intersect at 268 feet, uh, I always round that up to 270, okay? And uh, yeah, we see that you're in there. Would like a copy of the handbook. We can get you a copy. Uh, we'll email you if we need to get uh, your mailing address because they don't let us email, mail things through email yet. They're working on it someday. I can see it happen. But so it's a pretty cool way to decide whether you could possibly put up a yield sign. It's also a good check to see if you have enough sight distance because if you aren't even close to having this sight distance for a yield sign, then you know you're probably need to be not only thinking about a stop sign, but maybe you've got other things you need to be worried about as well. Now, when you put up these signs, you may want to put up conspicuity markers, things on it to alert people. You can even put a thing in the short term that says new, okay? And you may even wanna think about a stop ahead uh, sign. And we'll talk about that here in just a second as well. At some point, you get enough traffic, you can put up traffic signals, okay? Uh, again, we're just talking about intersections in general, but uh, traffic signals are a natural progression. But when you put them up, again, think about what people will see. That's the same intersection. Do you see the signal head? Anybody here can see the signal head? There's actually two of them. One signal head is way over here to the left. And I got to get a pin color you can see. Over here to the left and one over here to the right. Now it's an old intersection. It's been grandfathered, but as they decide to upgrade it, they have to decide what do they do to improve the conspicuity of that particular signal head. It's in an urban area and don't typically have a lot of issues with it. And they do have some head signage, you know, some warning signage, but again, Think about those human factors whenever you're thinking about the intersections. And of course, you could put up a roundabout. There's a big controversy. Some people love them, some people hate them. 
Um, it's a challenge for everything. But the big key here more than anything else is if you decide to put a roundabout in, and they don't have to be the big ones. They could be a mini roundabout like you saw in the very opening photograph. Think about them carefully. They can reduce the conflict points. And more importantly, they reduce the crossing conflict points, which are the most severe crashes that we have to deal with. You can go from 32 vehicle conflict points down to eight, and none of them are crossing. Okay? So something to keep in mind. Roundabouts is just an idea. We could spend a whole session on just roundabouts. Okay? Now, when it comes to an intersection, this is further back, but do you need an intersection warning sign? Do you need to put one up ahead of time? Some agencies put them up for every intersection. Some agencies don't. But let's talk about whether you need them or not. This is actually in the handbook. Okay. What we did is we went through and we checked the math just to be sure. We made some minor modifications to the distances in the current version. But the concept is this. If you think about that sight distance thing again, remember those sight distances? This is the distance you're sitting at the intersection. And there's different distances for the speed that people are traveling. The low end of stopping, you've got to be able to stop before you get to the intersection. Okay. Otherwise, you have to think about whether or not you've got to do something else with either geometry or signage. Passing is another type of sight distance. We don't want people passing at an intersection. Okay. And so if you've got an intersection inside the passing zone, you may want to mark it that way. But at the same time, that could also decide whether you need to put up an intersection or sign or not to warn people, hey, you might not want to pass here. But it turns out truck turning, getting those trucks off the minor road onto the major road is actually the more critical issue. It takes longer, it's got a longer distance and a longer time. So being conservative, we rounded up a little bit. But if you think about it, if you're in the zone between truck turning and stopping, you might want to put one up, you may. But if you're below the stopping distance, you can't see, absolutely, you should put up a sign. And of course, we put it in the table inside the traffic chain handbook rounded to the closer <laughs> uh, five miles an hour increments, just like we marked the roadways with signage to keep it pretty simple. So in the red area, you should put up an intersection. In the yellow, you may, depending on other factors. And of course, if it's outside that, you can see further than that, you normally don't use it unless there's some other factor. Again, thinking about those human factor issues. So one last question on signage. What's the proper sign here? Is it the Y? Is it the center sign? Or is it the one on the right? So which of the three is it? What do you think? Some people say the center. Some people say none. I can agree with you there, Craig. I can agree with you. You cannot tell. The main road goes off to the left at the corner. <laughs> okay? And that can be very challenging. Technically, if you only put up an intersection sign, the one you'd want to use is the one here on the left. Okay? because the main road is the one that you're staying on, and then the road goes off to the right. But this is why I'm a huge fan of what is now allowed is the combined curve and intersection sign. You can replace two signs, one for the intersection and one for the curve, with a single sign that's actually better for the public. Okay? So in this particular case, you could actually use a W10 sign, and one sign like this could actually do a better job telling the public, hey, you're going to the left on the main road, but there's a spur in front of you. Don't go down the spur unless you really need to, okay? Now let's talk about markings a little bit. And now this marking's at a mid-block crossing, but as soon as you put up a mid-block crossing, it's a form of an intersection. The challenge when it comes to markings is they do a lot of good of explaining who's got the right of way and where people are going. but New York state law isn't completely clear, okay? In this particular case, there's a marked crossing, so it gets a little easier. But uh, if we're at an intersection with no markings, is there a crosswalk here by law in New York state? 
Does this intersection actually already have a crosswalk technically? Anybody say yes or anybody say no? Yeah, it does. New York state law says that if you're at an intersection, then it actually is technically a crosswalk. You don't have to have markings, but it's really hard for people to know where they're supposed to go. So if you have much pedestrian traffic at all, you really wanna think about putting up markings. They do a really good job of improving how people can see intersections, okay? Markings are one of the best things in terms of improving safety, uh, both for the pedestrians and the vehicles driving on the intersections themselves. They make the intersections more visible. So it can be very, very helpful. So here's an intersection not too far from where I live and it doesn't have markings. So I just took the old electronic pin and I drew a couple of markings in. For me, it doesn't make a huge difference. I can see the sidewalk and it's pretty obvious where I'm gonna be walking, okay? But look at the difference it makes for the driver who may or may not be able to see this particular intersection, especially at night, this particular one can be hard to see. People don't have their house lights on. But you put some markings in there and it shows right up. So think about markings if you've got much pedestrian traffic at all, but realize as soon as you put the markings down, you have to keep them maintained. So is that something you wanna keep doing every year, every two years? Because like it or not, crosswalk markings and snow plows, they are not friends, okay? Now, one thing people like to do, and you see it in the news all the time, people wanna put all kinds of alternative stripes down. Here's one where they've made it look like it was 3D. It really looks cool driving in one direction, but take that exact same intersection and drive it in the same opposite direction, it doesn't do much. People real, realize what the white lines are, whether they're just the cross markings like this, or you actually come in here and you put in what's called a ladder, where you put the markings like this, okay? In both directions, okay? People know what those are. Those are your primary markings. Anything else you're putting down there can actually create distractions. So be careful about that. Um, I actually like what's called the ladder, which has the markings good for the crosser, the two parallel lines, the markings good for the driver. They tend to last longer with the vehicles wearing off the paint and they're good for everybody. But again, you have to look at economics. One thing in the intersection I would also think about, especially in rural areas where you don't have a lot of pedestrians, stop bars. I'm a huge fan of stop bars. They're relatively inexpensive. And if you're worried about it, you can even tape them, okay? Now there are two types of stop bars. If you have a stop sign, you use the solid bar. If you have a yield sign, you can actually with, use a yield bar or tiger stripes, sometimes they're called, where you put a bunch of teeth down there, triangles, it's supposed to mean yield. I don't see as many of these as you might think. We're still not quite used to them. Uh, supposed to be using these when we have a yield sign up. The goal is to tell people where to stop their vehicle. Because if you don't, they'll tend to stop a little bit too close you really want them stopping at a particular location, put up a stop bar. Plus it defines the intersection even better. Even in a place with relatively low volume of traffic on a narrow urban street, like a village or a city or even a hamlet, a stop bar can make a big difference, helping vehicles know where to stop. And even if a stop sign gets knocked down, you actually can use the stop bar to help you navigate an interstate, okay? Now, there are lots of other things that we can do with intersections. Uh, some other ideas we can think about, we could put in wider stripes for everything of the crosswalk markings, the center line markings coming to it. We can put up bigger signs, okay? We can put on signs on both sides. For pedestrian crossings, we can put up the countdown timers. In fact, they're now required in a lot of cases. Um, you can put in traffic calming and ball belts. But I just wanna give you a couple of ideas for interchanges that have become more popular over the last couple of years, but you don't see a lot of them here in New York State. And the things we may wanna th be thinking about, especially when we get some odd situations or we're not quite sure what to do, okay? Now these are concentrated mainly on pedestrian issues, but you could even think about using them in some rural areas, there are some. 
Now here's one. This is called the Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacon, RRFB. And I actually like the RRFB. I think it's a pretty cool little device. Okay. Let me get my arrow back so I can get this to play. Um, these can actually work pretty well in the rural area. Like if you had a camp and you only had crossings now and then, you could cover these signs up except during the camp when it's open. And when the camp is open and you actually want to use the crossing, they would activate this by using a push button. So most of the time it would just be covered. Camp season, it would be open, but not flashing. And then when actually used, it would actually flash, okay? And this is me crossing and my uh, lovely wife taking a photograph of me walking like an idiot across the street, okay? But they actually work pretty well. And you'd be amazed how well those actually work, okay? There are some places that are automated where they actually automatically can be detecting pedestrians. Eh, it's a little more expensive. Most of the time, just hit them with your elbow and they work pretty well, okay? Now, if you need more than that, you can actually go up to something in an interchange where you don't have a traffic control. You don't have a traffic light, but you want people to stop for the pedestrian or the bicyclist. But the bicyclist, by the way, should be walking their bikes in these cases, but they don't always do that. This is something called the pedestrian hybrid beacon. You may have heard the term hawk light, okay? I actually like these things, they're pretty cool. And if I had a full another 20 minutes, I could show you some video of this. Just search for pedestrian hybrid beacon and there's some pretty good stuff out there. My favorite YouTube video on this one actually comes from, I think it's the state of Delaware, okay? Um, well, no, excuse me, Wisconsin, state of Wisconsin. The concept is these things are dark most of the time, okay? I took this photograph when I was on a trip out in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Can you see the pedestrian hybrid beacon? No, you can't. It's dark most of the time. Even when you get close to it, it's dark. And that's the idea behind this. Most of the time, the traffic just keeps going. But when somebody wants to cross, they activate these things. It starts flashing yellow, warning people something's about to change. And then right before it changes to all red, it turns solid yellow, just like you would at an interchange. And then it becomes all red. And so it's just like a traffic light, it's all red. So now the pedestrians can cross. At partway through the cycle, it then actually starts flashing red, which tells drivers, hey, if there's no more pedestrians, you treat it like a stop sign, you can start moving again. And then it goes back to being all dark at the very end after a quick yellow flash. It's actually pretty cool. And they actually have found very su good success in reducing the crash rate and more importantly, the injury rate because the speeds go way down. And remember, speed is what kills when it comes to pedestrians and vehicles, okay? Now there are other things we can do, raise crosswalks, speed humps, all kinds of fun things you can do at interchanges. But again, think about human factors. So what I wanna do is I wanna spend just a couple of minutes on some case studies, get you thinking about what we talked about. And then I'll have a couple of minutes to answer some questions if you've got any. So our first one is a case study. Now the interchange, I'm not looking at this one here though it's an awfully long pedestrian crossing. I don't know why they don't put it up here where it's narrower. We wanna reduce the distance. What I'm worried about is way in the distance you can actually see there's an interchange down there. Okay, so you're coming down this roadway and you come up past a stop ahead sign and you come to this interchange. What would you do here differently at this particular interchange? And it's, by the way, an always stop. Not always a fan of always stops, but this one happens to be an always stop. What would you do here? Any thoughts? Maybe a signal light, maybe realign the roadway. Clear the tree, I agree with you there. The tree was a major issue because you couldn't see the stop sign. There's a stop sign here. It's hard to see behind everything. Let me get a good pin color here. Let's go with yellow. Yeah, there's actually a stop sign behind that tree. Realigning, no, it's actually a pretty good alignment. It's perfectly square but some minor realignment can make a huge difference. And this is, again, we didn't talk a lot about these markings, but markings can matter. 
which is the priority roadway? What is the actual traffic? Yes, I'm standing on the curb when I took the photograph, but I'm also much closer to the intersection than you would be before you should see the stop sign. If you were back at the distance of 300 feet where you should be able to see it, you still couldn't see the sign. So the tree was an issue. And yes, you could double stop this. What you may wanna think about is actually bringing the curb line back and putting in a proper turning lane and figuring out who has priority. What is the highest traffic volume? Okay. Now, if you actually go to this intersection today, it's not quite like this, but they actually have put the straight lane on the right. And it's a left turn lane going to the left. So think about how people are moving through an intersection. One of the best things to do is get yourself in a situation where you've got fairly large volume, watch the traffic for a while and see what they're doing. And even a minor volume, go out in the morning when going to work, coming home from school, watch the intersection, look at the human factors, okay? So here's our case study number two. Here's an interchange. And you can see there's, this has actually got two stop signs. There's a stop sign here. I know it's yellow, but I'm just not gonna change the pin color stop sign there. And the traffic, the problem was there were lots of crashes at this particular interchange. Almost all of them, well over 90% of the crashes were vehicles coming up to the interchange from the left and being struck by vehicles coming from the south. So what do you think the problem is? Why are all the crashes occurring to the south, even though that picture that you see there is taken to the south, there's huge sight distance. There's not a sight distance problem here to the south. In fact, if anything, the sight distance problem, as you see in the bottom right, is to the left. So what do you think is happening here? And what would you do about it? Distracted driving, always a possibility, but the fact that 90% of the crashes were occurring people to the right and not to the left and the volumes weren't that different, we thought there was something else. You always have to worry about distracted driving. A stop ahead might have been needed, things like that. Yep. Do you remember I had you put your hand up and glance to the left? You look at that hand. And look at all the things that you missed. What happened was we noticed people would get up to this interchange and this is all busy here. Very hard to see, okay? But if you look to the right, the intersection is skewed behind us just a little bit outside that range where we really wanna be at 90 degrees. And what was happening was people when they would stop they would actually look, and I'm going to erase all my ink just because it gets distracting otherwise. When they would stop, they would look to the right and they would see down the road, but they would miss the vehicle coming here. They'd really concentrate on this area to the north because of all those trees. So what they do, really simple. Clear out as much of the brush as possible. Make sure the stop bar was aligned, maybe even cheat a little bit so it's obvious it's askew and make it a little easier to see to the left. And guess what? The crashes went down. Think about the human factors, okay? Last case study, I think we'll have time for. Let's see, do I wanna do all four? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do this one and then we'll call it good for the day. Uh, we've got an intersection. You're coming up over the hill, okay? Sight distance is about 350 feet from where you really need to have the interchange. Posted speed is 35 miles an hour. Prevailing speed is 50 miles an hour. People are actually driving 50 coming over the hill. Do you need a, a warning for that intersection? People coming over the hill, do they need a warning sign? Well. This is where you have to look at what people are actually doing, okay? If you take the traffic sign handbook and that table that we provided and you look at 350 feet, if you just go with posted speed, okay? And I'm gonna change my pin color one last time. If you just go with posted speed, you've got 350 feet 
you think you can, you, know, you may want to put one up, you're probably okay. But people are actually traveling 50 miles an hour. And if they're actually traveling 50, you're inside the range where you really should have that sign up. So when you're looking at intersections, make sure you look at what people actually are doing, not what they think they're doing, okay? So with that, I did have one last case study. Oh, this is the sign you would use, by the way, it's the diagonal. I had one last one we could talk about interchange, but I know what the mind can absorb, but the can endure. So we'll go ahead and let you guys go. But I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, you can go to our website and get more information. You could download the books that we talked about. Again, we can mail you these. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than glad to answer them. So with that, uh, hopefully you got something out of it. If you picked up one idea, great. If you use that idea, do me a favor. If you picked up something and you use it, pop me a note. Just say, hey, we decided we were going to double sign an intersection or something. Send it to me. I'm looking for ideas like that for all the things we're doing with our training. And with that, everybody have yourself a good day. I hope you don't have too much flooding with what's going on. And next week, we're talking about budgeting. And uh, hopefully, you'll get something out of that one as well with our Tuesday webinars. Everybody have yourself a great day and a great week. Take care.